There's just no way around it. And so I apologize to you for that. Please understand uh, that that's the case. And uh, I really would love to be able to have a conversation with you afterwards. Um, the doctrine of God's providence takes us sometimes in strange and unexpected directions. I'm trying to think through an illustration of this. I don't know if it will be helpful or not. A couple of years ago, my wife and I, um, I was teaching a class in London and we were able to stay in England for a week, rent a car at Heathrow Airport, and we had never been down to Devon and Cornwall, and so we decided to take a week and go down there. We actually stayed uh, just outside of Port Isaac in Cornwall. If you've ever watched the Doc Martin show, that's where it's filmed, and we spent about a week there. It was really wonderful. But uh, there was one day when we wanted to go to one of those you know, big old houses that they have in England, and you pay 10 pounds, and you get to tour it, and you enjoy it. And Actually, the one that we went to was really amazing because they had a great old library full of theological books that uh, I wished I could get hold of and, and take home with me. But anyways, the, the GPS that we were using that day took us through some back roads, and down in Cornwall, the back roads sometimes are only one lane roads. You're, you're driving along and it's really pretty countryside and you're going here and there and we went up and we were through the woods and we were out in the farmlands and we came down this slope and we, you know, remember this, I'm driving on the wrong side of the road on the wrong side of the car. Okay, All, everything's wrong. And we come to this corner and we turn the corner and there's a sign and it says, Ford. Now, it's not telling me the kind of car that I'm driving, but you know what a Ford is. You, you ever watch an Agatha Christie, Miss Marple show from the 1930s, and there's this 1930s era car, and it goes down, and it goes through the stream, and it comes back up again? That's a Ford. And I saw this sign, and immediately I thought, do they still have these things in England? Because, you know, you and I have been taught, never drive through moving water, Right? Every time that there's a potential flood hazard, never drive through moving water because it can end up being really bad. And the sign says Ford. And I'm looking at this and my wife is sitting there, no, she's sitting there, and, and we're thinking about what, what should we do? And I realized, well, if, if they have it, then it must be safe because people must use this every day. So I guess that I can go through it even though I'm not so sure that it's something that I really am comfortable with doing. But we went over there and we stopped and we looked at it and decided, I'm gonna drive this rental car through this Ford and there we go. So step on the gas, go forward, get to the other side and look at each other and say, wow, that was cool. Well, that's sort of like what providence is. It takes us to places we don't expect and the Lord says, go through this. And when you come out on the other side, you can say, well, that was unexpected, and it's not really what I wanted to do, but it was good, and I'm glad that I did that. And so sometimes I think that that's how we have to view providence. The Lord puts things in front of us, and he expects us to obey him, to go through with what is before us, and we do so for his glory. Well, we're at the end of the paragraph in the Confession of Faith that deals with providence, and the title that I was given is The Confident Church in the Providence of God. This is paragraph seven. It's very brief, but take a look at it there in your bulletin. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner it taketh care of his church and disposeth of all things to the good thereof. It's a very fitting conclusion to the chapter on God's providence because it helps us, it, it encourages us and strengthens us. It helps us to be able to look to providence and trust in God in the circumstances of life, whatever they may be. Now we have said in the previous messages that we live our lives under the providence of God. And in this paragraph, we're taught especially about God's loving concern for Christ's bride which is the church. Much of the preceding doctrine in the first six paragraphs 
teaches us that the Lord providentially rules over all things. He's the governor and sustainer. He upholds all things. And this is certainly true about his church, his elect people who were chosen from before the foundations of the world. But what our fathers are trying to teach us is that we are not simply the subjects of providence in general, in the way that all peoples and all creatures are under God's providence, but rather our fathers saw fit to emphasize the special nature of providence towards his people. We, we all enjoy the benefits and the blessings of providence, generally speaking, because we're humans and we live on this earth where God upholds, d- directs, sustains, etc. But now we need to think even more specifically of the way that he works in providence for his people. Now what is behind this statement? It's this, because he has loved us eternally, from eternity he set his love on a people he calls his church. Because of that, he cares for and works all things for the good of his people. And that's the point. Brothers and sisters, God loves us with an unbreakable, everlasting love and always does everything good for his people, his church. Now that's not, it's not the message of the prosperity liars. There is no such thing as a prosperity gospel. There's no gospel in it at all. That's not the point here. God always does good for his people. Sometimes the good that he does is what we saw in Genesis 45 in Joseph's life, that he takes us through the ford, although for Joseph it was much worse than going through a ford, wasn't it? This doctrine is woven into the fabric of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, And it has two basic parts. The Lord cares for us, and the Lord arranges all things for our good. So let's consider these two parts, and I want you to think through them with me. First off, he cares for us. Now, you know that the confession of faith is supplied with proof texts. They're they're verses that we turn to, and we consider them, and they help to support the doctrine that is laid out in, in the paragraph. They're, they're not proof texts in that uh, our fathers are not saying this is the only place in the Bible to go to to find these things. Nor are they saying that these proof texts necessarily themselves directly address what they're saying is read these texts and then go to the commentaries and see how they were understood in the era and that will help you to see why we put the doctrine together this way. And so here's one or two of the proof texts that are attached to paragraph seven. Listen to these words. This is Isaiah 43, three through five. I am the Lord, your God. When he says that, we need to listen. And we need to invest those words with the fullness of their meaning. This is the Lord, the one who exists forever and ever, and who is your God, the God that you serve and you worship. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The the Lord is addressing us, his people, with this wonderful language that is intended to remind us of who he is and what he has done. He goes on, he says, I gave Egypt for your ransom, a reference to the Exodus, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, You have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Now, this is uh, towards the end. It's in the second half of the book of the prophet of of Isaiah. And it is, in some ways, preparing the people for the difficulties that they will face when they're taken away into captivity in Babylon. The Lord is saying, I am yours, and I will watch over you, and I will keep you. And you do not need to be afraid because I am with you forever. But Isaiah is just picking up language from Deuteronomy. In preparation for the conquest of the Holy Land as the the generation that died in the wilderness is gone and now the younger generation has grown to maturity and is prepared to cross the Jordan and enter into the land and they're hearing the words that Moses speaks to them on the plains of Moab. They hear these words from the Lord, Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and of good courage, 
Do not fear nor be afraid of them, that is, the peoples in the land. For the Lord your God, the identical language of Isaiah 43, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's his commitment to his people. He goes with you. You obey his word. You're not afraid of what is in front of you, though it may cost you. Don't be afraid of it because the Lord is with you. And of course, that's repeated by Joshua in Joshua 1.5, where he reminds the people of God that the Lord has said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. How many times does the Lord have to say that? But that's not the end. Because it's repeated for us in the book of Hebrews. You'll remember these words from Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Someone might say, but that's the Old Testament and that's for Israel and that language was given to them. Really? Now, I disagree with that. That's another story as to how we deal with the hermeneutics of the Old Testament. But the writer to the Hebrews was not afraid to take those verses and apply them to Christians who faced a great deal of trouble. Remember why the book of Hebrews was written? although actually the book of Hebrews is a sermon. It's a record of a sermon from the apostolic church. But the, the, the Hebrew Christians were being tempted to leave behind the things of God because they were facing great difficulties. They had been persecuted. Their goods had been taken from them. Many were put in prison. Some of them died. Hebrews 11 is not a hall of fame of faith. It's a, it's a demonstration of the fact that God's people have always lived by faith, whatever circumstance they face. And in summary, after laying out all of those things, the preacher in Hebrews says this, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. He himself has said, well, that's a reference to the fact that the Lord said, I am the Lord your God. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What is there that any human can do? You know, you know, the worst thing that a human can do to you is take your life. And what happens when your life is taken? You go into the presence of Christ, don't you? No, it's, it's not the end because you await the resurrection when body and soul are united forever. But Paul was able to say that when he died, it was a better thing for him to be in the presence of Christ than to remain on earth. The worst thing that anyone can do to you is to give you the privilege of being in the presence of Christ. But the point is, this is the Lord's promise to us over and over again, Old Testament and New Testament. In fact, our Lord Jesus made this promise to his people when he gave them their commission, recorded in Matthew 28, 20. We, we looked at this very briefly yesterday. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all my commandments. And then do you remember how we end? how that ends, how Matthew's gospel ends. Lo, I am with you. What's the word? Always. Most of the time, except when you, you know, face that sign that says Ford and you really don't know whether to cross it. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now here we are, nearly 2,000 years after the Lord Jesus spoke those words. The end of the age has not yet arrived. But I, I think I'm reading them fairly to say that that's a promise that Jesus gives to us today, that he is always with us, that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. And so we have to read these texts from Old and New Testaments and ask ourselves questions like, can we trust him? Can we take his words at face value? Do we remember who he is, the one who spoke these words? Now, I, I may say words like this to my wife or to my children, to my grandchildren, but there may be circumstances that prevent me from fulfilling them. But this is the high and holy one who inhabits eternity. This is the great I am who is always faithful to his people and to his promises, who has never failed, the one who cannot lie, who keeps his word forever, and who over and over again tells us of his loving care. You know, if the Lord says it once, it's true. We don't need him to repeat it, but he repeats it because we are weak people. We, we are forgetful people. We don't always trust him the way that we should. But here we have five different examples from Old and New Testaments to remind us that the Lord who is the, is the one who is with us. And so when we read these words about the providence of God in a most special manner taking care of his church and disposing of goods, we, we have to think of them 
those words in terms of these promises that come to us from the eternal God who will never leave us and forsake us. Let's think about some of the many ways that he shows his love to us. The Westminster Larger Catechism in question 63 expresses itself this way. What are the special privileges of the visible church? And the answer goes like this. The visible church hath the privilege of being under God's special care and government, of being protected and preserved in all ages, notwithstanding the opposition of all enemies and of enjoying the communion of saints, the ordinary means of salvation and offers of grace by Christ to all the members of it in the ministry of the gospel, testifying that whosoever believes in him shall be saved and excluding none that will come unto him. That's the the special privileges that belong to the visible church. The idea is that Christ's church enjoys special privileges that are not extended to others in this life. We as the believers, we as the people of God, receive from him gifts that perhaps are not given to others. Thomas Goodwin, another great Puritan, put it this way. This is a little bit of a longer quote than I usually like to read, but stay with me because it's helpful. The reason of this is because the building of God's church is his own business in a more special manner more than any other. The church is the apple of God's eye. It's his concern for us. Goodwin goes on. Therefore, he will be sure to do it himself and more immediately be seen in it. As it is said of Christ personally, the tabernacle of his human nature, that it was not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, as the apostle there speaks, that is, it was not framed by the power of nature as other men are, but by the Spirit, who was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. So it is true of Christ's mystical, his body, and the tabernacle of his church. It is not of the ordinary make that other societies of men, whether families or kingdoms, are of, It is not made with hands, with human wisdom or power as they are, that is to say, is not of this building, Hebrews 3 and 4, every house, says the apostle, is built by some man, that is all kingdoms, families, and societies, God in an ordinary providence leaves to men to build in their own way. We we have our homes, we have our society, they are the result of either the work that we have done, the, the money that we've paid to others to do it for us, or because people have worked together to build a society. That's ordinary providence. Goodwin goes on. But, says he, he that built all things is God, which is spoken of God's building his church, which is his house, and all things appertaining unto it, as is evident both by the earlier words in verse 3, he that built the house is God, has more honor than the house, And also by those words that follow after, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. The reason why thus himself by his spirit builds it is held forth in that one word. It is his own house, and therefore he will oversee the doing this himself and will do it so that none shall share in the glory with him, although he uses them. This is his house. I don't mean this building. I mean the congregation of which you are a part. You are his house. It belongs to him. You belong to him. And because of that, there is a special love that he has, a special concern, a special watching that he does over you for your behalf and for the good of his people. Let's think through this a little bit. We said that the Lord loves his people and he does good for his people. But also we need to say that he arranges all things for the good of his people. You know, the the confession of faith, one of the things that I try to teach my students is that it's a system of doctrine. And so it's what what we sometimes call a woven document. That is, there are 32 chapters, and we should not look upon it as 32 chapters that are isolated from each other, and we can just dive into one of them and think that we understand everything about the doctrine. But rather, it that one chapter has tendrils or or roots that are woven into the rest of the document and we need to see it as a whole. We need to see the entire context and not just the individual chapter. So that's what I want to do. I want to show you how our fathers put together the doctrine of providence for the good of the church, for the benefit of the church in the confession of faith. And you know, 
virtually the first thing that we notice when we open up the confession, I realize you don't have one, so I'll have to read these, uh, some of these references to you. Almost the first thing that we encounter when we open up the, the first chapter of the confession is a statement about providence, interestingly enough. It, it reads like this. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Providence is a gift that is given to us, functioning as general revelation, and if my interpretation of Romans chapter 1 in the last session is correct, we are able to see the hand of God and read providence based upon what the scriptures reveal to us. Not inherently by our own knowledge, but based upon what God has given to us. Providence functions as revelation. It is true, though limited, and it teaches all people that there is a God and that he must be worshipped. But it doesn't reveal God as a trinity. It doesn't reveal the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. But for the church... We need to look more directly at God's providential care as he shows that to us in the world. Though I will miss it, I'm told that after this session there's a lunch that will be served out there. And if I can go back to my illustration from last night, you will thank God for the food that you've received and it was given to you, many hands were involved in its preparation, but it comes to you from God. We, we recognize that and we can see that and we pause customarily to thank God for what he provides for us. That's something that's for the good of the church. It gives you strength so that you make it through today and you can come tomorrow to wherever you worship and join with God's people and sing his praises. But there's more to what God does in providence. Listen to this. This is also from chapter 1. The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations, that is, it was the common language in uh, the first century in the Mediterranean region. The Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek, being immediately inspired by God and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentic. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal to them. But because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God who ever write unto an interest in the scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated into the vulgar, that means common, language of every nation unto which they come, that the word of God dwelling plentifully in all, they may worship him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. Hold your Bible in your hand for a moment. Okay, you can open it up to any page and you can say the providence of God made sure that you had a Bible in two ways. That we still have the originals, or at least copies of the originals that were written in Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. We're able to look at them and read them. And we have people who have expertise in understanding what Hebrew and Greek are all about. But also, probably none of you just held in your hands a Greek New Testament or Hebrew Old Testament. You held up a translation. This happens to be the New King James Version. That's, that's what I'm holding in my hand. That's an example of God's providence to his church. We, we are not left to ourselves. We don't have to wonder, how is God to be worshipped? Or what am I to do in my life? How am I to follow him? Do I, do I wait for an impression? Is it a mystical experience? Is it a leap of faith? Not at all. It's a fully informed life in which we go to this word, we read what this word says, and we follow what this word is instructing us to do. And all of that is a result of God's providence. We wouldn't have it if throughout all of the centuries he hadn't ensured that copies of the word of God came down to his people. And today we have it. In fact, I, I think, how many copies of the Bible do I have at home? Right? You know, 550 years ago, none of us would have owned a Bible. Because... They were so expensive, they would, it was necessary to copy them out by hand. Movable type had not yet been um, invented. Um, it comes towards the end of the 15th century in Germany. 
and then Bibles begin to be printed, but even then they were very expensive. It wasn't until Luther translated the Bible into German that now ordinary people could begin to read the Bible and literacy grows. We live in a literate age when we have the Bible in our own language and in many different translations, all of that because of God's providence. That's a great blessing. It's a blessing that we enjoy week by week and day by day. We are to read it, we are to hear it, we are to love it, we are to follow it. The chapter says that there are controversies of religion. Uh, that's true. How are they settled? They're settled by an examination of the Bible, by looking into what the Word of God says. It teaches us. Now, we don't know the original tongues, but we enjoy the translations and they help us. And the confession of faith speaks in those terms. Now, you know the words. You probably have taught them to your children. Things like Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's the word that we hide in our hearts. And it's the word that, that we have that we hold in our hands that we put into our minds that helps us to face temptation and difficulty in life. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How do I know how to walk? Because God in his providence has given to me a book and that book lays out for me steps. Now it doesn't tell me um, to do specifically this or that. One of, I remember when I was a young person, one of the big questions that everybody was asking is, how do I know the will of God? Maybe people still ask that. Well, the Bible doesn't tell you who to marry or where to go to college, but the Bible tells you to be holy. The Bible tells you that you are to pray. The Bible tells you that you are to worship. That's the will of God. And we know that and we do those things. Turn to Psalm 19. The contrast there is very clear and very plain. We have the difference between general revelation and special revelation. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night utters, reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and the words, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. This is what our confession calls the light of nature. Sometimes we call it general revelation. It's something that's available to everyone, everywhere, at all times. We've talked about it already this weekend. But the psalm goes on, and it continues to speak of the blessing that belongs to God's people. Look at verse 7. General revelation is true, but there's something better. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The word of God has been given to you it is to your benefit. It is for your help. Another way that we see God in his providence providing for the church, I just simply will repeat very briefly what I talked about last night, it is the means of grace. God in chapter 5, paragraph 3, God in his ordinary providence maketh use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. Chapter 14, paragraph 1, which we didn't read yesterday, goes like this. The grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word by which also and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened. The fact that you have a church to go to tomorrow, people to worship with, ministers who will open up the word of God to you is a demonstration of providence. Because providence is behind the means of grace. They continue. In some places, they have been withdrawn in God's providence. But they've not been withdrawn for you. Because you will have that privilege of being with God's people 
20, pro approximately 24 hours from now. You'll sing, you'll pray, you'll hear the word read, the word will be proclaimed to you. That's providence. And that's a gift of providence that God gives, especially to his church. As we said last night, just as there are means or methods in creation expressed in terms of providence, so also there are means that God has appointed for the salvation of his people. You are who you are because God and his providence brought the means of grace to you. Word and spirit converted you. And tomorrow you will be strengthened as you gather with God's people in that way. We heard a little bit earlier today from paragraph 5. Let's revisit it. The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruptions of their own heart to chastise them for their former sins or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts that they may be humbled. God uses circumstances of life sometimes allowing us to go on in them so that we're humbled. When our brother was preaching about it this morning, the fact that sometimes this takes a long period of time, I remember David and his sin. Right? David committed adultery and then he committed murder. How long was it until that was uncovered by Nathan the prophet? At least nine months. And perhaps longer. But we can say for sure at least nine months. David went on in the stupor of his sin. And what happened as a result of that where the Lord allowed him to go on in a sin of adultery and murder? What happened? We get Psalm 51 where David is crushed. David is humbled as a result of the sin that he committed. It, the paragraph goes on, to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself. I, I have a feeling that after David sinned in the way that he did, that that drew him closer to the Lord. Now, he, he, it, outwardly, he never recovered from that sin. There was the Lord determined to send trouble upon David and his kingdom as a result. But David drew closer to him. The third benefit, to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin. Uh, th here's the temptation. I know that I will fall prey to that temptation. I will watch out for that temptation. And if it comes across my path, I will head in the opposite direction. We learn from it. And the confession just goes on and it says, for other just and holy ends. So that whatsoever befalls any of his elect is by his appointment, for his glory, and for their good. It's for their good. It's for your good. So if he allows you to fall into these times, which sometimes he does with us, it is for our good. Let it be a humbling experience. Let it be an experience that draws you closer to him, but recognize that even in enduring this difficulty, it is for your benefit and for his glory. But there's more. What about the spread of the gospel? This is a really interesting one. This is in chapter 20. Chapter 20 wasn't in the Westminster Confession. It was added by the Congregationalists and our Baptist fathers decided that they would keep it in their confession of, of faith as well. It goes like this. The revelation of the gospel unto sinners made in diverse times and by sundry parts with the addition of promises and precepts for the obedience required therein as to the nations and persons to whom it is granted is merely of the sovereign will and good pleasure of God not being annexed by virtue of any promise to the due improvement of men's natural abilities by virtue of common light received, without it which none ever did make or can so do. And therefore in all ages the preaching of the gospel hath been granted unto persons and nations as to the extent or straightening of it in a great variety according to the counsel of the will of God. Now this is a little bit challenging, but we need to think through it. Turn with me, for example, to Acts chapter 16. What the confession of faith is seeking to say to us is give us an explanation of why the gospel went in one direction and not in another direction. Why did it go west and north rather than south and east from Jerusalem, more or less? Well, this is expressing to us something of what we find here in Acts chapter 16. Verse 5, the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Verse 6, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, 
they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, wait a minute. Think about that for a moment. Paul wanted to go towards Asia and preach the word of God so that men and women would hear the gospel and be converted, and the Holy Spirit said no. No, that's not my purpose. So that means that at that time, in that circumstance, that area was still dark to the gospel. Even though it was Paul's intention to go, the Holy Spirit said no, and Paul did not pursue that. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, another reason, another region. But the Spirit did not permit them. Paul's trying to go this way, and the Spirit says no. So Paul tries to go this way, and the Spirit says no. So what happens? Passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, that's Greece, stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul's intention was to go this way or to go that way. The Lord said, no, I want you to go in this direction. And Paul did, and the gospel goes to Europe. And from Europe, it extends to Rome and ultimately to, uh, to the rest of Europe. The preaching of the gospel depends on God's providence. Why me? Why not somebody else? It's God's providence. I don't have any... Jewish blood in my veins. I have not done the DNA tests that people do, but my sons have, a couple of them. There's no Jewish blood in us at all. My ancestors painted their faces blue. They danced around bonfires. They worshiped the sun and the moon, and when they conquered their enemies, they ate them. I'm a Northern European. Celtic on one hand, Scandinavian on the other side. That's who I am. There's nothing about my background, but God in his mercy in 1970, brought the gospel to me, and I believed it. Why? Why? I don't have a reason. But it's the providence of God that does that, bringing the gospel to the elect. What about worship? Another privilege that belongs to the church. In chapter 22, paragraph 6, we read this, God is to be worshiped everywhere in spirit and in truth, as in private families daily and in secret each one by himself, so more solemnly in the public assemblies, which are not carelessly nor willfully to be neglected or forsaken, when God by his word or providence calleth thereunto. Now providence here probably has two senses. First, it simply refers to the weekly return of the Lord's Day. Each week, uh, as the days pass, we come to the first day of the week and we go and worship on that day. That's what providence is. It's the regular passage of time and events in the world that are created by God. Tomorrow, when we go to worship, we do so by means of God's providence. Commenting on this passage in the Westminster Confession, uh, an early um, advocate of Baptist principles, John Toombs, put it this way. It concerns every tender conscience which receives these principles to consider how they can acquit themselves from not observing the Lord's Day in public assemblies where God is invocated in the name of Christ and the word of God truly taught, especially in such places where they may enjoy these, these performed by the present ministers and are deprived of their former ministers in communion and cannot of themselves discharge those duties. You heard our brother say in our first session this morning that you need the means of grace. God, by providence, allows you to benefit from them, and they will come to you tomorrow. But there's even more. What about interchurch relationships? Listen to this. As each church and all the members of it are bound to pray continually for the good and prosperity of all the churches of Christ in all places, we have an obligation to each other, and that is to pray. We we can't pray by name for every church in the world or every Christian in the world, but we can pray that God's blessing would be upon his people, um, especially tomorrow when they gather together. In fact, uh, if I've got my time right, in New Zealand, it's already the Lord's Day, and soon they'll be beginning their day. Lord, bless them. Bless the Christians there as they begin their day and they come to worship. And then as the time zones pass, as the world turns, 
Time zone by time zone by time zone, the people of God will gather together. We don't know who they are. They have different languages. They have different faces, different ethnicities, but they're the people of God. We pray that God will bless them on that day. That's an obligation that we all have, and we ought to be doing that all the time. And we ought to seek to um, expand or to, to make, be a benefit to the good and prosperity of the churches of Christ. But the confession goes on and it says that when the providence of God brings us together, we ought to do even more to the opportunity and advantage for one another. Here we are in Texas. We are scattered uh, throughout one of the, the largest states, second largest state in the United States. We're at a distance from each other. And yet still there is a sense in which there is a commitment to each other. And some of you have, have told me stories of how your pastors have preached in each other's pulpits and how you've been strengthened and helped by the fellowship that you have with one another. That's, in a special way, God's providence to you so that you're not isolated and you're not out there by yourselves, but you know that there are other Christians and you trust that the Lord will bless them in the way that you hope that he will bless you as well. And that's what our confession is seeking to teach us. You see, it wants us to realize that in many ways, God's providence has given us blessings. We have the scripture, we have the Lord's Day, we have the means of grace, and we have churches, and we are able to strengthen and help each other. And so we can walk into the future with a great deal of hopefulness. When this topic was assigned to me, my, my first thought was to look into Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to conclude with the words of Ephesians 3. Listen to what Paul says. You know that the book of Ephesians is perhaps the, the longest and most powerful statement about the nature of the church. He says this, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now, in this present age where we live, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church, I'm sorry, might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Do you, do you know what Paul is saying here? He says, the church is a display to which God points for the angelic beings to say, there's my wisdom. If that doesn't thrill your heart and soul, I don't know what will. Because it tells us that God cares more for the church than he does for the world and that the church is the focus of his attention, and the church is the display of his glory. You know, John Calvin talked about the, uh, the world as created. He called it the theater of God's glory, and it is. Uh, I, I think uh, there are so many places that I've been in the world that, that amaze me and astound me at their beauty, but there's nothing that can compare with the body of Christ. Sinners who have been forgiven of some of the worst kinds of sins imaginable, and yet they will spend eternity praising the God of heaven and earth because the blood of Jesus Christ has purchased them. And Paul says that's God's purpose for the church. It is that the church would be the place where he displays his greatest glory. Yes, creation shows his power and his wisdom. And I, my favorite vacation is to go to a national park and, and watch it. As one of my friends said, there's a reason why there are national parks. You go to see them because there's something amazing about them. I love to do that. But there's nothing better than the church, a group of sinners who've been saved by the blood of Christ and who will together stand around his throne forever and ever to bring him praise and glory. Now you see, the doctrine of providence is woven deeply into the fiber of Christian theology. It takes us perhaps sometimes to places where we don't expect to go. But when we begin to think about it, when we recognize it, when we see that God's hand is at work in the world around us, we are greatly strengthened. And this is especially true in the word of God that he has given to us, special revelation, and in saving grace where we see it working. 
Going back to the first paragraph of the confession, we are told that providence is God's upholding, directing, disposing, and governing. And these things are evident in the world, but they're even more evident in the church. So brothers and sisters, I say this to you, let this encourage and enliven you. And as Paul says there in Ephesians 3.13, don't lose heart, even in the face of trouble. You know, Paul having said that, these wonderful things about the church, he says, for this reason, don't lose heart at my tribulations. Paul knows what it's like to be in prison. He knows what it's like to face difficulty, but he also knows that the church is the centerpiece of God's love. The Lord says he will never leave us. He says that he is our helper. Why should we fear? He is with us always, even to the end of the age we live in. And so, brothers and sisters, glory be to God for his kind love to us in providence and in special providence. 